Hello, happy Thursday. We are live. Let me make sure we're going live in all these places. Dun dun dun. Here we go. Go live. Awesome. Hello and welcome to our uh, Lunch and Learn Thursdays. My name is Maggie Nielsen and I am a partner at Purse Strings. Um, as just a little refresher, Purse Strings is always here to provide uh, financial education for women, just some knowledge, know-how, some insight, answer those questions we hear all the time. Um, but when you're ready to go to a professional, um, when you know, you're going through a divorce and want to pay off your debt or get investing or get a windfall, um, we have our purse strings approved professionals who are smart and savvy and love to work with the female market. Um, we call those our purse strings approved professionals and Brittany Senate here is one of them. Um, so we're so excited to have you on today, Brittany, to talk about, you know, busting some myths of this good and bad debt and so many things. Um, but before we dive in, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do? Sure. Thank you. So first of all, hello. Uh, my name is Brittany. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, but I run a national wealth management practice that works with people all across the U.S. from coast to coast. I literally have clients, you know, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and all the way down in like San Diego, California, and up in Portland, Oregon, and all the places and corners in between. Um, so really excited to be here today. Um, I'm originally from Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. I went to University of Michigan for undergrad, so go blue. It's like Football season, it's in the air. It is here. Yeah. College football is upon us. So I know, uh, Maggie, that you're based in uh, Chicago area. It's like Big Ten country. I'm still in Pennsylvania where Penn State is. So it's like coming alive, which is really exciting. But we're not here to talk about football. We're here to talk about money things. Um, and so I'm excited to be here to talk about debt myths. You know, as a financial advisor, I, I call myself a holistic financial planner. And part of that holisticness is because you know, money touches so many parts of our lives. It's not just like dollars in our bank account or money or our numbers on a page. You know, it's how we feel about the money. And it's also like what money allows us to do. So I get into like some really deep conversations with my clients just about their goals and their dreams and how they feel. And that's all really important in terms of me understanding my clients and how I advise them as an advisor. I'm also holistic in the fact that you know, I am licensed in insurance and investments so I can cover like the defensive and the offensive strategies in the plan. Um, and then I also, you know, obviously try to be an expert where I can um, in other areas of money. So like topics with debt and where I can't be the expert that my clients need, I'm also there to help connect them with other experts as well. So just super appreciative to be connected to the purse string community because that obviously helps me better serve my clients to make sure that I'm um, passing them on to people that uh, we're going to serve them well as well. Um, but yeah, excited to be here today to talk about debt. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those topics that's probably pretty controversial. Um, yeah. And so I'm excited to just like break down some some ideas here and and just have a really vulnerable conversation about debt and what it means or doesn't mean to us and how it's, you know, helping us achieve our goals or not and things like that. So yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah. And we're excited to have you on. And I love this holistic approach. Um, and, you know, you do get very vulnerable with your financial professional. And that's one of the reasons we want to make sure it's someone you feel comfortable with and you feel because um, sometimes we say, you know, you have to get financially naked. Um, and so we just want to make sure you feel good with that person. Um, so that's why we have these great professionals. Um, but let's dive into these myths that we hear all the time. Um, and I think the first one I love that we're going to start with is everyone says, oh, there's good debt and there's bad debt. You disagree. I know that. Yeah. Let's, let's hear why. Well, yeah. I mean, first and foremost, you know, I, outside of my life as a financial planner, I'm also like a yoga instructor. And so, you know, I bring that part of me into my conversations with my clients as well. And just as like a personal philosophy, I really tried to let go of the polarities of life that just, I think are often hammered our way, you know, and there's a lot more to life that's living in the gray area of, of the world and like being on the extremes of good and bad and right and wrong. I mean, obviously there's moral right and wrong, but you know, I think um, oftentimes we feel like there's only like two solutions to a problem because that's kind of just how our society has framed a lot of our, um, our problems and solutions. But um, you know, there's no good or bad. There just is right. There just is first of all. And, um, you know, sometimes with the debt conversation, sure, is it maybe more advantageous to maybe take out a personal line of credit at 8% interest 
versus putting stuff on a credit card at 22%. Of course, you know, if that's an option that's available to you, taking out a personal line of credit at a smaller interest rate is going to be better for you in the long run of that debt than, you know, putting on the credit card. Um, but I don't know about you, but like sometimes these, like these, these decisions still like elicit this like flight or fight response in us. And it, and it's, I think starting to team that a little bit and just recognize, you know, one going in debt is not going to kill you. Um, <laughs> hopefully like, you know, like, um, You're not a bad person. It's not, You're not, not a bad person. Anyone. Yeah. Even though like our flight and fight response, like kind of makes it feel like that way, at least for me, sometimes it's like, let's take a breath. Like this isn't a life or death situation for most of us. Um, maybe we need to go in debt to cover bills and things like that, which does get into like life or death. Right. But, but the act of just actually taking on debt, it's not good or bad. It just is. And I think the, the conversation worth having here is the mindset around debt. And I actually, you, um, the newsletter that came out in September kind of started to touch on this as well perhaps shifting our mindset away from good or bad um, into gratitude because accessing debt is actually an opportunity for us to get access to a resource to live life the way we want to live or need to live or to create a new opportunity for us, whether it's starting a new business or going back to school or, you know, making sure our, our children have access to education or whatever other resources they need. Um, and so I think if we can kind of just like take a deep breath, pause, and try and find opportunities to recognize how grateful and lucky we are to be in a position of abundance and to have access to debt as a resource to potentially change the trajectory of our lives. I think that is where we can start to create a better relationship to debt, um, much healthier relationship to debt, give ourselves more grace when we need to access, you know, debt and um, hopefully calm our nervous systems down a little bit so that we can just, you know, maybe be a little bit more level headed, even when it comes to how we pay it off and how we handle it and manage it in our overall financial plan. Um, so I don't know if that resonates with you, Maggie. I think that's, Honestly, it's a practice that I'm always trying to work on myself because like, don't worry, I'm not impervious to these things too, just because I'm a financial advisor. Like I still have those feelings where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I'm still paying off student loans or whatever. And I'm just like, you know, I have my own thoughts and things about them, but I'm like, listen, me going to school gave me a great opportunity to right. be in the prof profession I'm in now, to work with the clients I work with now. What a great opportunity I had to take on that debt because it's allowed me to be in the position I'm in today. Um, and yeah, I'm still kind of paying that stuff off, but I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to pay that off because it's giving me the life that I want to live, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm not sure if that resonates. I know you said you just started the book club too. And, and that was, I think, a topic that was coming up as well. But that's, I think, if there's one thing that I can leave everyone with with the conversation today. It's it's really how we can change our relationship to debt from good and bad to grace and gratitude um, yeah. for allowing us the opportunity to, to make the decisions we need to make to take care of our families or take care of ourselves or to make the pivots we need in our life to create the life we want to live. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. In our book club, we were kind of talking about, you know, if some days you just need to buy those diapers for your babies, you know, and so today we're we're putting them on the credit card and that's that because we have to, you know, do today. Um, but, you know, you sometimes we take these investments in ourselves knowing that we're going to project forward, having confidence in our future self that we'll be able to take care of it um, and knowing that, like, we can do this and it's just a stint for now. Um, and it's just it's just like, you know, it's just a, you know, it's it's really not the end of the world. Yeah. And I think, too, like, again, like just relating it back to just other things in our lives. Right. Like you know, needing to put something on a credit card or needing to take out a line of credit to take care of something. It's one decision point along the path of many decisions you're going to have to make between now and whenever the end comes for us. Right. And the idea of a perfect decision, I think is just also just like a philosophical thing that like, there's no perfect. Anytime I sit down with a client and I'm financial planning for them, 
we're going to leave that conversation and something's going to change in their life that's going to slightly change the plan that we just put together. Even if it's just the slightest little bit, there's always going to be things that are going to be nudging us different ways and we're going to have to be making adjustments along the way in the plan. And so I think if we, again, can give ourselves grace in those decision points and recognize, listen, this is a decision point among the line of many decision points. And today, the best decision for me to make is accessing credit on either a credit card or line of credit or HELOC on the house or whatever. And then knowing and trusting yourself that like the next decision, I'll make the next best choice for right. me and my family at that point of time. And I think too, like that's where working with a planner is helpful because, you know, obviously like you're living your life today. Yep. Um, and one of the benefits of working with someone like me is I get to work with clients among the vast spectrum of what life could look like for anyone over the next 30 years. Right. And so like, I, I'm helping my clan, my clients live today and plan for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But I also have the foresight in my conversations with my clients of their version of them in 30 years. Right. And so I can say to them, Hey, you know, I, you know, I have you in 30 years as a client already. And these are the conversations we're talking about. Like, this isn't going to be a conversation you have to worry about yeah. forever, even though sometimes it feels that way in the moment. Um, and so hopefully that's helpful a little bit too, to recognize that like, you know, trusting yourself that you're making the best decision that you can for yourself and you're using, well, hopefully this conversation too, even makes people aware of other resources they could be using other than credit cards, right? Because there's mm -hmm. other ways to access capital other than credit cards um, that might be more advantageous, you know, or, or better fit for someone in their needs. Um, so yeah, that helps a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so one of the next myths um, is that, you know, we get this debt, it is what it is. And then everyone says, you know, we need to pay this off as soon as possible. Yeah. Get to work, pay that debt off right now. Yeah. So, you know, and I think a little bit, this kind of tail dovetails from the previous question, this idea of good and bad debt, the reason why they say good or bad debt is because ma mainly of the interest rate, right? Like, like good debt is like the lower interest rate debt, things like our student loans and our home mortgages. Um, and like the bad debt tends to be like the higher interest rate debt, right? And so, um, you know, it surprises me. I meet with clients today that took out mortgages last year and some of them have interest rates at like 3% and they're like obsessed with paying down their mortgage. And I'm like, that's like free money. <laughs> like, yeah. why are you rushing to pay back free money when you could be using that money in other ways to start growing your wealth in other areas other than just being, you know, paying off debt. So I think the big conversation here around paying off debt as soon as possible is an opportunity cost conversation. Exactly. Um, and we have to remember, like, you know, we're raised by parents, you know, Maggie, you and I, maybe are similar ages, we're like millennials or whatever. Yep. So our parents were taking out mortgages when interest rates were significantly higher. And for them, when they had mortgages that were 12 or 15% interest, of course, it made it, it made sense to prioritize paying down that debt because it was so high. The interest rate was so high. But um, which is wild to me. Like, I was so surprised even when these interest rates were for houses were very low um, and people were still refinancing. It's pretty unheard of to get, you know, your interest rates at 3 um, percent. Yeah. And it makes sense that at 12 or 15 percent, you'd want to work on it because let's say if you put your money in the stock market, you might only get 8% back. So like you said, it's that opportunity cost. Right. And I'm glad you brought up that equation because that's typically the conversation I'm having with clients where we're trying to decide, does it make sense to pay the minimum or does it make sense to pay it down more aggressively? What is that doing to your surplus cash flow? And what else could we be doing with that cash flow to put you in a better situation or help you achieve your goals right later down the line? And so one of those equations to think about is what could I be getting in the market? And a general like rule of thumb, I think that most people would agree with, is like around the six to eight percent range. Okay. If the debt is around six to eight percent or lower, um, it makes sense to just pay the minimums on that debt because you could get about six to eight, ten percent in the market, and um, you know, paying that debt off any faster, you could do better in the market, right? Yeah. So it's when we have debt that's going above that 8% range where it makes sense to say, hey, is there a better way to structure this debt so that we could get it lower? Mm -hmm. 
Or is there, how should we be thinking about paying this off more quickly so that we're not paying more interest than we need to? Um, but again, what is it doing for my overall cash flow? What my surplus is and how is that positioning me in relationship to my other goals? You know, the, one of the greatest assets that a lot of us might have, I don't know, everyone that's joining today, but like for those of us that are millennials, one of our greatest assets is time. Mm -hmm. And if, Paying off debt aggressively is eating away at your asset of time to invest in the market. We can never make time up. Like time, right. time is just That's, in all aspects of our life. It exists and then it's gone. It is not a renewable resource, right? We can always like hustle to maybe make more money, but we can never hustle to create more time in our lives, right? right? And so, so that's the question and conversations that I'm having with my clients is like, what's the timeline of your goals and how much resource are we taking up and are we losing the resource of time to try and pay off this debt more quickly? Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a way we can balance both where we can like kind of chip away at the debt a little bit better, but make sure we're still also investing. Right. Um, so that way we have something in the market that's taking advantage of the time that we have to be in the market. So, so that's kind of, I think what to be thinking about is, um, the opportunity cost of paying down that debt because not all debt when it comes to interest rates is created equal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the other side of this equation, Maggie, like there's the logical answer yep. <laughs> makes sense on paper. And then there's the emotional decision too. And, you know, for some of my clients, the debt is just causing so much stress and anxiety. And it's like, yep. okay, let's talk about like, what is stress and anxiety doing for your total well-being? You know, like, and we have to have an honest conversation about that. And sometimes I need to just like educate them and just be like, yo, like, not that your feelings are invalid because your feelings are very valid, but this really shouldn't be stressing you out as much as it is because it's so low interest. And I try to educate yeah. them. Hopefully that helps. But, you know, sometimes, you know, something is just eating away at them and they would just feel a lot better if they just paid it off. Um, because we get told kind of, you know, Debt is bad, period, right. you know, and that's that. And so they work to pay off this debt where it's like, we don't need to be anxious about that. You know, we there is a plan. We have a professional. Yeah. There's all these things. Um, we've done the mathematical analysis and it all adds up. Um, so, yes, granted, we are emotional creatures. We have to do that. But we also have to realize and kind of break some of these things that we've been told about how bad debt is and all this stuff. Because, yeah, opportunity cost, all these different things that we've already been talking about. Um, you can see how it kind of falls, falls in line there. Yeah. And there's just so many, um, unfortunately, like echo chambers in the, you know, internet space that, you know, try to shame you a lot for the debt and tell you, you can't start investing unless you've paid off your debt and all these things, which I know that that's gonna be one of the debt myths we talk about as well. But, um, but yeah, I think this is again, like what you said, this is where the professionals really come into play here yeah. because, we can give you the perspective that maybe you don't have and also the tools and resources to understand how paying off debt more quickly or more slowly can impact your overall financial picture. Um, and that's just, you know, just an extra, extra intel to have when you're making that decision about debt payoff. Um, so to move on to the next myth, um, and I think this one is huge, is that, um, well, I'm just going to move Go whatever order. Go whatever order you I'm want. I'm just going to move on to the one in my head is that people will carry a balance on their credit card yes. um, because they think that keeps their credit score up. I, I actually don't know what it is, but they, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I'm really yeah. surprised. One of the most surprising things becoming a financial advisor, um, you know, there's a couple questions that always come up with clients and it doesn't matter how much income they make or like, what their age is. I'm always kind of surprised by some of these questions. And in some of the areas, it's like Roth IRAs and for, and traditional IRAs. That's a big question mark, right? That's no. not the topic of today's conversation, but that's one of them. And then I'm still surprised with this one where people think they need to carry a balance in order to build credit. And I think in their mind, they're thinking like, oh, I need to show the creditors or the credit score companies that I'm paying something off consistently. Some, we well, always hear about like 30% and use 30% of your credit card. And that's like the magic number. Yeah. And they're like, oh, if I keep it under 30%, I just need to always be carrying a balance because that shows that I'm like being responsible with my credit. Right. And so <laughs> no, you're, pay you're just paying the man. You're just paying interest and you don't need to. Um, and so, yeah, again, I think 
maybe this is even more important than the like good and bad debt conversation. It's like, if you're carrying a balance because you think that's helping your credit score, newsflash, it is not, okay? It is not helping your credit score. Pay your balances off in full. And, you know, and even, you know, when I was a kid, one thing that my mom did teach me about credit cards, she would like, we used to be able to go to the mall and like, write a check right after you put something on your credit card and like pay your credit card off right then. Really? Like, yeah. Like at Macy's or whatever, we used wow. to just like be able to make a payment right after putting something on our credit card. So like my mom would always like use the credit card to like get points or whatever, but then she would literally write a check right then and be like, now I'm paying this off. And so thankfully that was a, probably one, some of the best money advice my mom ever, ever gave me. Um, is to pay your balances off in full every month, right? And ideally, in a perfect world, again, none of us are perfect, we're only putting what uh, we can on our credit cards that we could actually pay for in cash. It's just easier, more efficient. We get points. We can use a credit card, you know, for all those benefits. So yeah, pay off your credit card every month, assuming that you can. If you cannot pay off your credit card, Make sure you're at least paying the minimum on time. Yes. And um, and then there's always opportunities to negotiate with your credit card companies too about some of that stuff as well. So you can also move your due date um, if there's a more favorable time of the month for you to make a payment. You can't do this like all the time. I think they let you do it like every six months or something right. like that. But, you know, everything's on the first, you know, and then it's like, I don't even get my first paycheck because it goes everywhere. Yeah. If you need to wait. To check later. Paycheck, yeah. Like there's room for you here to talk to your credit card companies and make sure that you're setting yourself up for success. Right. Mm -hmm. And so just know that like you can have conversations with them about moving your due date, um, you know, negotiating how much is due and all that other stuff. Um, but yeah, please make sure if you can pay your credit card off in full, pay it off in full. And if you can't make sure you're making the minimum payment on time. And if the timing of your payment is not working in your favor, request that you move your due date to another time of the month when it is, uh, more favorable for you. So, um, so yeah, super good, uh, debt myth. I've been surprised at the, the people that have come in to have conversations with me that thought they had to carry a balance and, um, and they don't have to. So yeah, don't have to, you're just paying the man. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, staying on this credit, credit score, credit card kind of thing. Um, we always hear that, you know, checking your credit score is going to hurt your credit score. Yes. Um, which I think, you know, we could all say we've seen some advancements that there's a guesstimate credit score, I think on most bank accounts now when you open them. Um, like Chase discovers what I have and I have those, but yeah, that? yeah. So let's talk about that real quick. So first of all, yes. So I have a Chase card. I'm not paid by Chase to say this or anything like this, but I have a Chase Freedom card. It's free. Um, and part of one of the benefits of the Chase card that I have, and it sounds like you have this too, Maggie, is they do like credit monitoring and, mm -hmm. and, and like a, an estimated credit score for you. And they'll even show you when there's inquiries and things like that, that you can watch how your credit score goes up and down. So um, I would definitely make sure that if people aren't aware if their credit card or their bank offers this, go into your app and like poke around and see if this is something that you can get access to through the institutions that you already have relationships with, because it's super helpful for me. It's really nice to have that access to the information. Um, and so that just, you know, taking a look at that on your app is not going to make your credit card or credit score go down. So that's one. Two, um, as consumers, we have access to free credit reports every year. So if you go to freecreditreport.com, um, you have to enter in some, you know, personal information. I think sometimes you have to enter in a, a credit card. They like charge a dollar to your card just to make sure it's like legitimate or whatever. You have to answer some um, security questions. Um, but you can get access to your full credit report through the three different credit reporting bureaus. Um, I think you get two per year. Um, I usually only do one in every couple of years or around like before I'm planning to make a big purchase. So like if buying a home is in your one to two year plan, like don't wait until you're about to apply for a mortgage to check out your credit and your credit history, pull that free credit report now, because who knows, like I've heard stories of like, you know, phone companies, like forgetting to close a phone account down and someone had like racked up all these bills because they weren't getting the bills. 
and they had to reconcile that before they could apply for a mortgage. So, you know, you want to just make sure that you're doing the due diligence there on your credit history um, and pulling the, uh, at least one credit report a year. You get it for free. So don't feel like you have to pay $85 for a credit report or whatever. Um, and just take a look at it and make sure that everything looks um, appropriate and correct based on, you know, what you know, you know about your history. And then do know that each of the credit bureaus, they calculate their score slightly differently, or like sometimes um, one of the companies that maybe you have uh, a line of credit out with might report to like two of the bureaus, but not the other one. So there might be like slight inconsistencies, but um, in general, they should be similar in score and range and detail of, of all that information. And so um, so hopefully that answers that question or that debt myth. You don't, checking your credit score, you're allowed to do that as a consumer. Um, there are soft credit checks and hard credit checks. Um, and I know so many hard inquiries within a certain amount of time can impact your score. Um, you know, if you're going to go shop rates for a mortgage or some other kind of like car loan or something like that, um, I would just make sure that you're talking to them about which type of inquiry they're doing. And I believe with the homes, if you do it within like seven or 14 days, they don't treat it as like a separate inquiry because they know that you're like shopping around for rates and stuff like that. So those are just conversations to have with um, people that you might be trying to get loans through just so that you make sure that they're doing the type of credit check that you think they're doing. Um, and if you're doing it within a certain length of time, it shouldn't have a negative impact on your score, um, contrary to what a lot of people might think. So, yeah. and um, just another reason I just wanted to highlight to the, you know, check it on your phone or wherever it is, is we all know cybersecurity stuff out there is wild these days. And so it's so much easier, to, you know, to get your card, to get hacked, to affect your score. Um, and so that's another reason why you probably want to keep your eye on it as well as just so you know, to know that, you know, no one's taking your card, no one's taking your identity, uh, no one's, you know, opening cards in your name, because uh, that would lead to bigger issues that you don't want to find out three years from now. Yeah. And I think maybe now might be an appropriate time to talk about like what factors even go into yeah. how your credit score is, is calculated because credit checks only impact 5% of your score. So like having your credit checked I don't know what, maybe we're all this, again, this idea of perfect, like, Oh, I don't want my score to go down a couple of points. I had this perfect score. Like one, the credit check is only going to impact this, your score calculation. It's only 5% of the other things that go into account for your credit score. So it's really, you know, the credit check is really only going to impact your score a little bit. It's a problem when you have them a lot more frequently. <laughs> um, but you know, credit check here or there for, for things is, is not really going to impact your score a great deal. And when it comes time to like get a mortgage or to get a home or a car loan or something, they're not saying like, you know, oh, a score of 825 and 800, like the 825 is going to get a much bigger, uh, you know, deal on their rate. Anything above, you know, 780 or whatever is considered like excellent credit. So like, as long as your, your score isn't like drastically going below certain levels or like, you know, if you're kind of hovering around some of those, um, I guess those ranges of what's considered yeah. like excellent, good, you know, fair and things like that, then these little like checks and little things like that shouldn't really impact your ability to access capital at a good rate um, for you. So I just want to mention that. But the other areas of credit that impact your credit score, the number one um, factor is payment history, that's 40%. So you making payments on time, which yeah. again, is getting back to making sure you're at least making the minimum payment on time. And if on time is hard for you, request that you move when on time is good for you. And then credit history, the like the length of, of your time of having credit is 21% of your score. So 61% of your score has to do with how long you've had credit cards open for or had a credit line open for to you and how um, on time you've been with your payments. So that's not something you can fix like yeah. overnight, right? And so that's why it's so important to um, make sure you get a credit card early, even if it's not something you need to use uh, on a regular basis. You know, my husband, um, he didn't have a credit card until we got married like two years ago. And I was just like, 
Like, how have you lived life as an adult and not had a credit card? Now, the good news is he didn't have any credit card debt, but right. he also didn't even have a credit score. It was almost like he like didn't exist as a person. And um, luckily, I was able to put him as a, a user on my credit card, which like instantly got him access to my credit history and my score, which was a good thing. But, um, you know, again, one of the things my mom did for me when I started to be able to drive, she was like, you have to have a credit card put your gas on the credit card and pay it off every month, you know, or she put me on a joint card with her um, that she paid off. So just so that I started to build history when I was really young. And now I have, you know, cards that have been open for 17 years or something like that. And that's something that you just can't change overnight. And that's something that does take time to build. And that is a big component of your credit score. Um, yeah, that's time thing again. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you know, I was listening to a, the podcast with Jay Shetty and he was saying how, you know, since he get, came to America at like 24 or 25, um, he couldn't buy anything because he didn't have a credit score. And so you had to start by building a credit score, which I never thought about, you know, people coming from different countries and that's something they have to build here, too. Um, so just jump in when you can. You know, today's the best day because it's just a time thing. Yeah. Yeah. Today's the best day. And, you know, for those people that. um are looking for credit cards to help them build credit. I always send people to Nerd Wallet. They do a really great job of cons uh, compiling the best credit cards for like different categories of need. And if you're a first time person that's trying to build credit, they have something that's called collateralized credit cards where you have to like give the credit card company like $200 or $500. And then that's essentially like your credit limit in the beginning. And then once like a year goes by, like they send you the credit card or the they send you the, the check back or whatever that you yeah. gave them to secure that line of credit. And then your credit line starts to increase and things like that. So there are options. Um, you're not going to be able to go like buy a car with it or whatever, but like there's little ways that you can start chipping away at building your credit. Um, yeah. And starting is, is really important because the length of time that you have that card is so important. Um, not to or open Pandora's box here, but I also was, uh, you know, listening to a podcast with, a. Uh, Dave Ramsey. And he was saying that, you know, he's all about no debt, no pay it up front, you know, pays off his mortgage and all this thing. And he's like, I don't have a credit score because I haven't had credit cards in 30 years. And I'm just like, you know, he's like, now I can't, you know, buy these apartments. And I was like, you, you put yourself here. Um, and you know what? Like, it's so funny. When I went to business school, my finance professor was like, if you can pay later, why not? Because you can use that money today to invest. Like to make money, yeah. To make money. So like why especially if, if paying later is like zero interest or very low interest, like why not pay later? Right? That's freeing up your capital to do work for you in other areas. And so yeah, I mean we could have a whole other conversation. Yeah, so we, um, um don't open that for, <laughs> that for him. Like here's this what do they say, the tiniest fiddle in the world or whatever? Like yeah, um playing the sad story for you, but like um but yeah, so, so yeah, length of credit, huge. And that's not something you can just fix overnight. Right. Um, a couple other things that come up, because I think this sometimes, I don't know if this is one of our debt myths or not that's coming up, but um, for some people, they pay off a loan and they think, oh, my credit card or my credit score is going to go up. I just paid off that student loan or just paid off that car loan or, or I, I just paid off that credit card. I don't need it. Let's close it. And actually... Um, your credit usage, your utility of how much is loaned out to you versus how much you're actually using, that ratio is also a big part of what goes into your credit score. And so if you had a $25,000 loan that was extended to you and you pay it off and that loan goes away, well, then that changes the ratio of credit extended and what you're using um, which could impact your credit score negatively, right? And so that's one thing to just be aware of. You know, for some of my um, clients, what I tell people is that, you know, before something closes, you know, again, with your credit card company, um, you can request extensions on your on your credit and on the credit card company to, to get a little bit more access to credit. Say your income has gone up the past couple of years or something like that. So if you anticipate something closing, um, maybe it's worth a check in with your credit card company just to be like, Hey, can I get a, a, an extension on my limit? Just so that when that um, line of credit closes, it doesn't totally throw off your ratio and your credit usage and your leverage that is part of calculating your credit score as well. Right. And then, um, you know, some people think like, Oh, I paid off that credit card. I should close it. Um, 
the one thing to be aware of, again, is going back to the length of time that you have credit open is such a big part of your credit uh, score. And so you don't want to close your longest credit card that's been open if you only have a really long credit history on that one card. Um, and perhaps what makes sense is for you to just like not keep it in your wallet. Um, so you're not tempted to use it. Um, but you know, just make sure that you're being aware of how long that that credit has been open because you don't want to hurt your score by closing that unnecessarily and then not being able to make up the difference with the other lines of credit that you have with your, with the right. history. Um, we're kind of running out of time here, but there oh, is sure. one that I want to make sure we touch on. And that is, I need to pay all my debt off before I start investing or even like speaking with a financial professional. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning this one. So no one, first of all, there's never a perfect time. I guess maybe the perfect time to speak with, with a perfect financial professional is now, right? Or yesterday, yeah. because yeah. time is one of the greatest resources we have on our side. And one consistent thing I hear from all of my clients is I wish I started sooner. And it doesn't matter if they're 30 years old or 60 years old, like people just wish they always started investing sooner or putting good habits into place sooner. Um, and so, you know, speak to a financial professional, um, so they might have resources that can help you better position your debt or give you a new, you know, point of view to how to manage your debt. Um, and then, um, you do not have to be completely debt free to take advantage of a financial professional and their resources. Um, and so I think as long as you're a good steward with your money, um, you have surplus available and you're trying to figure out what the best place is to use that surplus, whether it is investing or paying off debt or doing some other things with it. Like that's a good of enough reason to speak to someone so you can start putting a plan together, an action plan together to help you reach your goals. Yeah. And and one of the things that really stuck with me uh, when we were kind of prepping for this call is that you were like, you know, you're worthy of one today. It's not yes. you know, at this point, but like the way that you phrase that is like you're worthy of talking to someone today. And it's not like, you know, you have to earn that worth or something, which really has stuck with me since our call. Cause well, it's thank you for, true. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Remembering that. Yeah. Sometimes the, sometimes the excuses honestly come up because we feel like who we are today is not worthy of that support or that resource. And so um, I would challenge people that if you're feeling like, oh, well, I'll do that when this happens, or I'll wait till I pay off this thing before I speak to someone you're worthy of that support today and you're worthy of designing the life you want to live today. And that's exactly what, you know, financial professionals do for our clients is we make sure that they're using their resources to their best ability to live the life that they want to live. And so thank you for remembering that. That's yeah. so important. I think too, that you're worthy of, of what you want. And um, so absolutely reach out and um, get connected with someone to help you put, put together a plan. Awesome. I think this has been filled with jam packed full of great information. Um, just taking down some of those myths and those common things we believe or we heard from our parents. Um, sometimes just you, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and their context that our parents grew up in is just totally different context than where oh, we yeah. are today. And so, um, yeah, we could go a whole other conversation about parental advice when it comes yeah. to um, just to yeah. you know, be my own plug here, we are reading the psychology of money in our book club, and I feel like a lot of those topics are actually covered in this book. So you can we can continue the conversation. Yeah, that's um, a great book, actually. Yeah, but Brittany, I appreciate you coming on and sharing this information with us. Um, everyone can reach out to Brittany. Her email's been going through the bottom. Um, she's also one of our purse strings approved professionals, so you can check her out on our site, purstrings.co. Um, and then we will be here um, again next week. And I think we're diving into more information about credit cards and understanding um, the best use of everything. Um, and so until then, be financially fearless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.